So you, you already got a standing ovation and you said <laughs> yeah, nothing. Yeah, don't have to do anything now, right? I think we're done. We can leave. <laughs> <laughs> bueno, primero deciros que yo hablo, hablo español, um, pero... Well, I speak English, but I'm going to do this interview in English because I think it's going to be easier for all of you. And we will have translation, okay? Nada, vamos a... So... To have Professor Peter Singer here with us. Um, he's just received uh, the BBVA Foundation Frontiers of Knowledge Award in Humanities and Social Science. And he's just published, published after 50 years since uh, Animal Liberation, Animal Liberation Now, which we will also be talking a little bit about. So I want to thank you for being here with us today. My pleasure, thank you. The father of the animal rights movement, but also the father of the effective altruist movement. And we're going to be speaking about Henry Spira and a little bit about animal liberation now. So, any initial words you want to start with? Oh, I want to say thank you very much for coming here. I want to thank all the people who organized this event. Uh, it was a great opportunity, as I was coming to Bilbao for the prize that you mentioned, to be able to come to Madrid uh, and to present this book. Um, so I was really happy to be invited to do that, and uh, both for the, for the book and the publisher, and also, of course, for animal equality. Thank you so much. Yeah, we've spent two days together, and uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, someone who's so important and who has won and achieved so much and to see so much humility. So anyway, thank you. So let me start by asking you, we're here to talk about Etica en Acción, uh, Henry Spira and uh, Como Doblego a las Multinacionales. So let me ask you first, why did you decide to write a book on Henry Spira? I wanted to write this book because um, Henry had been uh, the most effective campaigner for animals, I think perhaps in the whole 20th century, anyway, in the last quarter of the 20th century when he was active, he developed new ideas about how to run campaigns for animals and how to actually improve the lives of animals and change things. Uh, so up to that time, I felt that really the animal campaigns had not been effective in bringing about any change, and perhaps we'll go into that more as to why Henry was successful at doing that. But um, at the time when I started thinking about this book, Henry had told me that he had been diagnosed with cancer and that it was not really operable and that he probably had maybe six months to a year to live. So. I wanted to get from him as much as possible about his life and about his tactics, how he had succeeded in bringing about change for animals uh, while I still had the opportunity. And Henry wanted that too. He didn't want the methods that he had developed to die with him. So that's why I, I, I recorded a lot of things with him in conversation. Uh, then I went, I went back to Australia. I was living in Australia then and, and wrote the book. Fortunately, he lived a little longer than his doctors had predicted, so he was able to see the book in print, um, but he didn't last, sadly, very much longer than that. So let, let's start with the beginning, because you've, uh, in the book you say, and, and you've told me um, about um, Henry's, Henry's thoughts on the anti-vivisection movement, until he arrived with these new tactics. So what did he believe in the 70s and the 80s were the issues of the animal protection movement and specifically of the vivisection, anti-vivisection movement? Right, okay, yeah, and we start with the anti-vivisection movement because that was the first campaign that Henry ran and we'll talk about that soon. But the anti-vivisection movement was quite old already in the 1970s. It, it in fact, was about 100 years old. Uh, the first anti-vivisection societies were founded in England when uh, vivisection started to, to grow significantly, so in the 19th century. And um, then there were American ones as well that developed. But Henry's view of what they did, which I think actually was, was accurate, was they had a mailing list of people that they would mail out their literature to. And so 
every month they would send out nauseating pictures of animals being experimented upon in various ways with descriptions of what was happening to the animals. And they were really very grim. They would make you very sad. Maybe they would actually you know, make you feel ill that people could do these things to animals. But then what? Well, then they said, send us a donation. And what are we going to do with this donation? Well, next month we'll send you another piece of literature <laughs> which will make you sick and angry and disgusted again. <laughs> and they kept doing that over and over. They'd been doing that for years. And they had not changed things at all. They had not saved a single animal from uh, being experimented on because they had no strategy for how to change. They just said, vivisection is evil, it should stop. But, you know, that was, of course, ignored by the uh, people doing the experiments and the industry behind experimentation. So nothing happened. But then Henry arrived and his first successful campaign was to get the Natural Museum of the Natural Museum of History in New York. Maybe I'm getting that wrong. The Museum of Natural History. The Museum of Natural yeah. History in New York. Right. That's a big word. Uh, to end experiments um, with cats. So I'd like to talk to you. I, I would like you to tell us a little bit about that and what was the develop. Like, what was he thinking when he came up with this strategy? What made it so different okay. than everything that had happened before in the anti-vivisection movement? Okay. So Henry's initial idea was he wanted to do a campaign about experiments happening in New York City because that was where he lived and that was where he could get some people to come to and to do something. And he, wanted, he was thinking about protests against a particular set of experiments. He also wanted the experiments preferably to be on cats and dogs, cats or dogs, because that was what people mostly cared about, especially then, and that was what you would be able to arouse people and get them to protest against. So how would he find out about these experiments? Well, America has something, I think many countries do now, called the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, government bodies are required to give you information about the things they do, and that includes the research that they fund. So he applied to the US government funding bodies to, uh, for information about experiments that they were funding in New York City on cats or dogs. And to his surprise, what he found was that six blocks from where he lived, the Museum of Natural History, which was a big museum that lots of people went to, and you saw the skeletons of the dinosaurs, and you saw, you know, the other things about animals, prehistoric animals, about geology as well, all of that. And he had never known, and most people had never known, that in the upper floors of that building, there were experiments going on which involved mutilating cats, depriving them of either their sense of sight or their sense of smell, and then examining their sexual behavior in unusual situations. So, for example, the experimenters have discovered that if you remove the sense of smell and, uh, from a, uh, a male cat and put it in a room with a female rabbit, it will try to mount the rabbit. It will try to have sex with the rabbit. Well, you know, that's going to be a very useful result for humans, isn't it? Um, <laughs> So, so this was a, the perfect kind of uh, first campaign that he, that he had um, to go to the museum, to tell people about what was happening on the upper floors, um, to get them to protest about it, and uh, to put pressure on the museum and on the, the government funding body to stop these useless experiments. I'm going to take a step back because... One of the most inspiring things about your relation with Henry was that you were a professor, and uh, I think it was New York University. Right. Yes, I was. In a, in and a uh, you had a you had a course on animal ethics, and Henry attended the course, and then you ended up writing a book about the student, right? So I'd like to know more about how that relationship started when you met Henry and uh, how exactly you, you started to develop this friendship and this special relationship with him. Right. 
so um, this was an adult education course. This wasn't a regular course for you know, undergraduates who would have been 20 or something like that. Um, this was an adult education course uh, taught in 1974 when I was actually already writing Animal Liberation. I had published an article in the New York Review of Books in April 73, and that brought a fairly strong response, and I had decided to turn this article into a book. So I already had some material on that, and when uh, it was suggested that I teach an adult education course, uh, I decided to do it using the material I had for the book. So I advertised this course on uh, essentially a new ethics for our treatment of animals. Um, and when the class turned up, there was like 20, 25 people in the class. Uh, they were mostly women, not entirely. Um, and they were mostly people who seemed like well-dressed and well-educated people. But there was one person who came in who, who didn't seem to fit. Um, firstly, he was really, you know, rather shabbily dressed, you would have to say. He wore, um, he wore sneakers. He, he didn't bother tying up the laces on the sneakers, I noticed. <laughs> they were always undone. Um, he had a, a, a sort of open-necked shirt which was hanging out, which in those days was a bit unusual. You usually tucked your shirt in. Um, and he had pretty wild hair. Um, and when he spoke, it was with a really working-class accent that I later learned he picked up working on the General Motors assembly line in New Jersey. So he'd worked as an automobile assembly worker. And he'd also worked as a merchant seaman. He'd spent several years on uh, merchant ships. Uh, so, so he had this different accent and different approach. Um, but he asked some interesting questions and comments in the class. Um, but the most thing that, that really was surprised me a little was at, at the last class, after the, class, the course was finished and we were getting ready to say goodbye and thank you and so on, Henry stood up at the back of the room and said, well, all of this philosophy is really you know, very good, very interesting, I know, but what really matters, doesn't it, is if we believe what I had been saying, um, if we believe it, we ought to be doing something about it. If something is wrong, and he was convinced, and most of the class, I guess, were already sympathetic, so they were convinced that something was wrong with the way we treat animals, then let's do something about it. That was Henry's line. And so he gave out his address, and he said, um, let's get together, let's, let's find a time when those who want to do something about it can meet, and you can meet in my apartment, and we'll talk about what comes next. So obviously, you know, I was pleased by that. I totally agreed that uh, I was wanting something to happen. I was hoping that when the book was published, people would do things about it. But here was somebody already ready to do something about it. Now, I was about to go back to Australia. My position at New York University was a visiting appointment. And at the end of the year, I was going back to Australia. But I said to Henry, let's keep in touch. I want to find out, you know, what you can do. Uh, and he was happy to keep in touch because um, you know, he also wanted my, my thoughts on, on what he was planning to do. So um, uh, I gave him, the, I wrote to him, gave him the phone number where I was. And in those days, actually, calls from New York to Melbourne um, were pretty expensive. And people usually talked for three minutes, which was the minimum time you're going to have to pay for, uh, and then hang up. Um, but Henry used to call and talk for half an hour, and you know, my wife would say, "Who are you on the phone with all this time?" Um, uh, so you know, in a way, the friendship built up mm -hmm. after the course in that way. And then, um, when I did get a chance to to go to New York and, and visit Henry, I would he would invite me to stay with him, which was a bit of a privilege because he was a bit of a loner and he didn't have anybody else living with him. So the friendship then built up. Um, as he was developing these campaigns and as he was running the campaigns. So the Museum of Natural History in New York, that's his first win. He ends the experiments, these horrific experiments that were absolutely pointless on cats. Right. I would say the first 
win for the animal rights movement in the U.S. Would you agree? Yes, I would totally agree. Um, because, as I said, you know, no, no other organization had actually stopped an experiment. Um, so maybe there were, I don't know, maybe there were dogs and cat wins, if you like, for some things, yeah. like, like in terms of, you know, how you sold animals or something of that sort, the pet shop regulations. But, but in terms of wins that you would really say were part of the animal rights movement, um, yes, this was definitely the first. So first win, what happened then? What did Henry decide to do then? So because Henry had achieved this, and it was very public, um, it was written about in the New York Times, um, it was an unusual thing. Uh, the science correspondent of the New York Times wrote a big article about how you know, this was shaking up science to have their ex experiments actually challenged in a way that, that had some impact on them. Um, and so Henry now had credibility. You know, remember, he had had, he'd done nothing before in the animal movement. Um, nobody had heard of him. He was a high school teacher. Uh, he worked out of his own apartment. He had no organization, no office. Um, but he now had credibility and uh, so people did come to him and offer him support including financial support if he wanted to run further campaigns. So um, he actually had one very short campaign which wasn't really a campaign but was a, a second success. Um, this is a bit hard to believe but Amnesty International, the organization that helps prisoners of conscience, was actually funding experiments on pigs to see whether you could detect torture, the signs of people being tortured. So to do that, they had to inflict harm on the pigs. Now, admittedly, they anesthetized the pigs to do the torture, but the pigs then recovered from the anesthetic and were examined. So they were probably still suffering the effects of this. Um, and Henry found out about this and thought, this is not something that an organization like Amnesty International ought to be doing. So he went to them and talked to them. He didn't start a campaign. He talked to them and said, look, I have this information. I don't think that this is the right thing to do. Um, this is what I did at the Museum of Natural History when they didn't stop their experiments. They got a lot of very bad publicity. Um, would you consider ceasing your experiments on pigs? And Fortunately, they listened to him. So that was a victory, really, with no campaign. Um, having done that, though, he wanted to do something bigger. Right? The experiments... So he'd stopped, I think, there were about 50 uh, cats being used in the experiments of the Museum of Natural History, and there were probably not even that many pigs, a small number of pigs. Um, but he wanted to do something bigger. So one of the bigger things was uh, the Dray's eye test. This was a test that the really was required by the US uh, administration, the Food and Drug Administration, to bring new substances to market if they might possibly get in somebody's eye. Um, and of course, uh, so many experiments, many substances could get in your eye. And the way you tested that was you took rabbits, you put them in a, in a, in a stock, like a kind of box with a hole for their head, so that only their head was sticking out. Then you opened their eyes, and you dropped the substance into their eyes with no anesthetic or anything like that. And they couldn't scratch, of course, because their, only their head was sticking out of this box. Um, and uh, there was actually an official chart. I think in the book there are pictures of it showing the degree of damage to the eyeball and how you would grade the results of this, how damaging it was, which included you know, horrible images of completely blistered eyeballs. Um, Really, really sickening. And Henry again used the uh, Freedom of Information Act to discover that major cosmetics companies were doing this test to um, release new products because, of course, cosmetics might get in your eye. Um, and this was a requirement, though. You know, in, a, in a way, the companies had to do this if they were going to release new products because it was required by the government. So... Um, Henry picked the biggest of the cosmetic companies at the time. The number one cosmetic company then was Revlon. And their headquarters were in a very prominent place in New York. If you've been to New York, just near the bottom corner of Central Park, there's a big skyscraper now. There's an Apple shop uh, sort of there downstairs. Um, but there was a nice forecourt, if you like. Um, and Revlon was in that building. 
So again, he went to Revlon. The first thing he did, as he did with Amnesty International, was to go to Revlon to say, look, um, I've got information, again through Freedom of Information Act, that you are doing experiments on, in this case, I think it was uh, certainly many hundreds, um, I think over a thousand rabbits that they were using each year to do this test on. He said, um, you know, I would like you to, I, I would like you to, so he didn't say I would like you to stop this because he realised that it wasn't realistic for a company to stop a test which was required for it to bring new products to the market. Uh, he realised that he was not going to succeed in getting Revlon to say, OK, we just won't introduce any new cosmetic products. Um, so instead he said, if you agree to set aside a tiny percentage of your revenue to fund a centre to develop alternatives to the use of animals for this kind of testing, I won't do a campaign against you. But unfortunately, Revlon did not take this guy seriously, right? As I said, he was not a very well-dressed, educated guy. He still hadn't bought himself a suit. Um, so uh, they, they really didn't take it seriously, even though, you know, they he made them aware that he had done this campaign against the Museum of, of Natural History. So they basically tried to stall, they tried to delay, they just, you know, they, they said nice things, but they did nothing, the tests continued. So <clears throat> Henry got together with those people who had offered him financial support and said, I want to run a full page advertisement in the New York Times. And he had somebody who was prepared to design it, uh, a guy called Mark Graham, who was a great advertising designer who did care about animals and volunteered his services. And uh, the ad, which you can see a picture of in the book, um, had a, a white rabbit with sort of bandages over its eyes um, and a couple of sort of laboratory flasks, like you would put things you wanted to test in. And the words, how many rabbits does Revlon blind for beauty's sake? And then it had testimony down the bottom, of experts saying, you know, these tests were not really reliable and, uh, you know, didn't really need to be done and should be changed and alternatives were possible. Um, so uh, they got that ad in, in, in the New York Times and at the same time they had uh, protests in this handy little plaza in front of the Revlon building and they got media to come out and... Uh, Essentially, it was a public relations disaster for Revlon because, you know, Revlon was trying to have this image of beauty, was primarily marketing to women who tend to be more sympathetic to uh, animals. Um, and uh, so, you know, the campaign continued until eventually Revlon realised that the bad publicity they were getting was costing them more, was going to cost them more than the very small percentage of profits that Henry was asking to be donated to fund a centre for finding alternatives. And so they did fund that centre. Once, once Revlon had agreed to do that, the next step was to go to Avon and then Estee Lauder and, you know, you can run your list of the big cosmetics companies and most of them just said, OK, we'll be in this too. They didn't, they didn't want the kind of campaign they'd seen against Revlon. So the centre was pretty well funded and it has developed alternatives to that uh, animal test, and that's why the European Union now um, prohibits cosmetics to be tested on animals and prohibits the importation of cosmetics tested on animals anywhere else. And yet, guess what? You still have cosmetics in the European Union. So uh, it was a completely successful campaign that I think validated what Henry had been saying. And what year was this? Uh, this was about 1980, I think, that the campaign started. So it's, it's so interesting to me to hear this in 1980 because organizations like us, like Animal Equality, um, it took us several years to get to, the po to that level of sophistication of understanding, well, we have to engage diplomatically with these companies um, and we have to try to get them to end this or this other form of abuse. Um, and if, if we can't reach an agreement, we'll launch a campaign. And that took us years, and Henry was already doing it in the 1980s. Um, and these strategies are still so effective. I mean, we've managed to get Compass Group 
uh, to, um, to eliminate uh, cages for pigs. We've managed to, to get hundreds of companies to eliminate cages for hens. And this basically is the same strategy that Henry was using in the 80s. Um, perhaps one of my favorite uh, tactics that Henry used um, was, and I think this was probably also the first time that was done, when he bought shares on Procter uh, & Gamble shares, and that gave him the opportunity to go to a shareholder meeting and tell Procter & Gamble, to stand up and talk and tell Procter & Gamble about the animal experiments, and they were soon meeting with him, uh, talking to him about what they were going to be doing about animal experiments. And it's, it's funny because now there's whole organizations in the US that are dedicated exclusively, like H HSUS or the accountability, not HSUS, but the accountability board, to buy shares to be able to influence these companies. So it's so groundbreaking and so innovative. So that is my favorite story, the fact that he would be so smart to buy shares and get into a company meeting and tell them what he thought. What is your favorite Henry Spira story? I know, I know which one it is already, so yeah. we're going to have a good laugh. It's a bit of a, yes, it's slightly <laughs> less serious than, than that. So um, Henry was campaigning against factory farmed chicken. Um, and in particular against, uh, there was a, a chicken producer called Frank Perdue, which was one, he was one of the biggest factory farm chicken producers in the United States. It wasn't the biggest, but maybe third. And he appeared in these ads, sort of, he, he did his, you know, he was, the, he was the front man, or he was the boss for the TV ads and gave it his personality brand, you know, Purdue chicken is so good, etc., etc. And Henry got information that Purdue chicken was actually very often contaminated with bacteria, and it was easy to get, um, uh, you know, diseases, salmonella, serious diseases <coughs> um, from, from chicken if it, uh, you know, wasn't uh, thoroughly cooked. And in those days, people were not aware of this. So um, he wanted to get the idea that chicken is not safe. Now, this was at the beginning of the HIV AIDS epidemic, right? So there was all this talk <coughs> about if you have sex, wear a condom. That's the way to have safe sex, right? And everybody's talking about safe sex. <coughs> so Henry decided to do an ad under the idea that <coughs> chicken is, uh, is not safe. There is no <laughs> safe chicken. So how would he connect this with the, uh, what people were talking about? He, <coughs> this, he and, and Mark Graham, the advertising guy I mentioned, talked about it. And they decided to put a chicken inside a condom. The problem with this is that, in case you haven't noticed, a chicken is actually a bit larger than the average male sex organ. <laughs> so they had to find a big condom, a particularly large condom. So they went around to um, places in, in uh, Greenwich Village saying, I want the biggest size condom you've got. And everybody looked at them, uh, they said, with a new respect. <laughs> So eventually they found a condom big enough that they could actually stretch out and the chicken could go in it. And, and you'll see if you get the book, there's a, there's a photo of the ad which has this chicken in a, inside a condom um, and uh, then it has the text about the lack of safety. So that wasn't exactly you know, a clear win. I mean, it's not that uh, people completely stopped eating chicken, unfortunately, but... Um, Perhaps it had an impact in reducing the number of people who, have, uh, who were buying chicken, and it certainly disturbed Purdue and the others. Yeah, it's a, it's a very, very <laughs> it's quite the story. So um, I'm going to engage a little with the public. Raise your hand if you consider yourself someone who works for animals or an animal rights activist, an animal rights advocate, someone who donates to an organization. Okay. A lot of people here. Uh, I want the reverse, actually. I want anybody who's brave enough to say, no, I don't. <laughs> I don't do any of that. Oh, well, there's a hand there. There's a couple of hands. We can, we can, stick, to the, so we can stick to the positive. <laughs> so, what can we learn from Henry Spira today? What's the most important lesson that he can teach us? Well... I think the most important lesson he can teach us is the one that, you know, go back to what I said about his view of the 
anti-vivisection movement. The anti-vivisection movement were basically saying they were for the abolition of vivisection. And of course, you know, Henry was for the abolition of vivisection too, but he just didn't think you were going to get anywhere if the only thing you were demanding was the abolition of this large industry which actually had quite a lot of support. And, and once the industry started getting attacked, they could do their own advertising, right? They could afford more advertising than Henry could. And they could afford advertising showing uh, an ill child and saying, you know, medicine through experiments on animals could save your daughter, uh, could save your daughter's life, you know? How, do you value a, a rat more than you value your daughter's life? This kind of stuff. So, you know, basically, what we can learn from Henry is to say, you have to be realistic in your goals. Of course, we would love to see the end of all animal exploitation, um, but uh, we're not going to win that way. We have to make a series of steps, and you have to have some victories so that people in the movement will get encouraged. So I think that's still something that we need to remember. We need to choose our goals and our targets carefully. But if we do, then we're not, it's not just that we're helping the particular, you know, the 50 cats, the uh, few pigs, the uh, uh, maybe many thousands of rabbits. It's not just that we're helping them, but we're building a movement, we're educating people about the way animals are treated, um, and we're bringing closer the day when we will finally be able to eliminate the abuses altogether. Yeah, and Henry Spear is a very well-respected advocate in the animal rights movement, and I think that there is a direct line from Henry Spira to Proposition 12, that is the most advanced animal welfare law in the world, that bans cages in California and the sale of animal, any animal product that comes from uh, an animal in a cage. And this has been upheld by the Supreme Court of the United States. I think there's a direct line. I mean, what can be more, more, more effective uh, than that? And you're also considered the father of effective altruism. Uh, maybe you can talk to us before I go into questions specifically. What is, for those of us, or those of people who don't know, what is effective altruism? Okay, so you probably already know what altruism is. Altruism is uh, doing something to assist others, to be, to be uh, good to others, um, not just to think of yourself, but to think of benefiting others. And, of course, others often would mean other humans, but there's no reason why it can't mean other beings capable of feeling pain. It can't mean all sentient creatures. Um, that's not so new, um, but what is new is the idea that when we act altruistically, we should do so on the basis of evidence about whether this is the best way to do good. Because if we have, you know, we, we all have an, a, a limited sort of budget of resources, right? If you donate to animal organizations, I don't see Bill Gates or uh, uh, Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk in the audience here. So you have limited budgets in terms of what you're actually able to donate. So the effective altruist would say, find the organizations that will do the most good with your donation and donate to them. And if you don't have money to donate, but you want to volunteer for an organization, that's great. Um, again, find organizations that will use your time as effectively as possible. And, um, you know, this, this may sound pretty obvious in some ways. After all, when we go and make a new purchase, nowadays I think everybody goes online and they do the research, you know, oh, I want a new phone. So, um, this is how much I can afford to spend on a phone. Um, can I get the best phone for the money that I can spend? Uh, that's, that's a normal thing to do. But when people give to charities, most people don't do any research on what is the best way of um, doing good. On, on, they, they give much more impulsively, much more emotionally. Um, and so a lot of money is given to organisations where it clearly is not going to do the most good. 
Um, and this is true in a range of different fields. It's true in helping humans, um, where often, uh, typically, I think we can do more good by helping people in extreme poverty in low-income countries than we can by helping people who are poor by the standards of an affluent society, but um, not nearly as poor as people in, in real poverty in low-income countries. So uh, that's one way of being more effective, but it applies everywhere. It applies in the animal movement as well. Um, okay, so that's what effective altruism is. You can... Yeah, we'll talk questions. more about yeah. it. And I actually want to link it to Henry Spira, because Henry Spira spent the last years of his life focused on animals that are raised and killed for food. And now there's a general consensus in the farmed animal rights movement or in the farmed animal movement that animal equality is a part of, that the resources to help animals are best invested um, in focusing on, on farmed animals. Um, how, what are the arguments that you would make to people in order to convince them to become more effective with their, with their activism for animals? Like, what, why, why farmed animals? Well, why farmed animals? Because in terms of the amount of suffering that we inflict on animals, it's overwhelmingly farmed animals that um, we are harming. Do you want... So they're telling me the time. Ah, they're what, telling you the time. Okay. <laughs> all right. Are we going on too long? Do I need uh, to get shorter answers? We're fine. Answers? We're fine. We're fine. We can okay. stay here all This Good. is fine. Sorry. Um, okay. So, um, for example, so, I mean, if you look at where money goes in the animal movement, um, I don't have figures for Spain, but I'm sure that it's similar. Certainly true in the United States. Money goes predominantly to shelters for stray or abandoned dogs and cats. Um, now, you know, it's not that stray and abandoned dogs and cats don't need help, but how many are there, actually? So, you know, the numbers might be thousands, hundreds of thousands, possibly in a large country like the United States, that amount to some millions. But, again, if we just focus on the United States, the number of farmed animals... Let's just talk about vertebrate land animals. So basically we're talking about cows, pigs, chickens, maybe some ducks and turkeys. Um, that is around 10 billion animals. So it just dwarfs the number of stray dogs and cats. And it also is dramatically more than the number of animals used in research, which actually in the United States we don't even have figures on. Um, but uh, it's roughly estimated to be not more than 100 million. So compare 10 billion to 100 million, um, you've got um, uh, a lot more animals being used for farm, in, in farms. And I think actually, on average, they, they may suffer more than the animals in experiments. The animals in, in experiments may suffer acute pain, but for a shorter period of time. And um, the animals in, in factory farms have miserable lives for their whole life, and then they also suffer acute pain when they're taken out and trucked off to, to slaughter. So, um, yeah, I think you definitely get the best value for your donations with farmed animals. And uh, if you look at... Uh, there is one sort of effective altruism website, or actually maybe there's a couple more, but uh, the one that is perhaps best known is Animal Charity Evaluators. They evaluate uh, organisations for their effectiveness, and uh, virtually all the organisations that they recommend are working on farmed animals. Yeah, and I think if you think about a mother pig that spends her entire, la her entire pregnancy four months in a cage and is basically moved from one cage to another for years, or a hen that spends 14 months in a cage without being able to, to, to practically move, I mean, this is chronic suffering that is happening to millions of animals. So I have so many questions, uh, not a lot of time, but I do want to ask about your new book, Animal Liberation Now. So in 1975, um, Peter published Animal Liberation, uh, the book that changed the world and that gave everyone a strong philosophical and ethical background 
about why animals should be cared for. So why animal liberation now? Well, because animal liberation was getting out of date, clearly. <laughs> okay. um, I did revise the 1975 book in 1990, so it was reasonably up to date then, but that's 33 years ago now. Um, and if you want to talk about, you know, so animal liberation is not just a philosophy book, it does provide an ethical framework for how we should treat animals, and it provides a critique of speciesism, the ide ideology that um, if you're not a member of our species, you don't have rights, and basically you don't count. But it also, the two longest chapters are descriptive chapters, one on uh, animals used in research, and one on animals used in, in farming, in factory farming. And those two chapters were 30 years out of date. And if the book was to remain relevant, um, then it needed to be updated. And I, I want the book to remain relevant. I think the message is still relevant because, unfortunately, you know, the, in one sense, uh, you were kind enough to say, Sharon, that, that animal liberation changed the world. Yeah. But you'd also have to say that it failed, right? Because people are still eating animals. They're still eating factory farmed animals. And it look, look, looked at globally, they're doing it on a larger scale than ever. That's partly because countries like China have become less poor and people are eating more meat there. So, so the problem hasn't gone away. We need to have new generations of campaigners fighting for animals, building on the progress that, that has been made, the progress that you've made with animal equality, for example, um, needs to continue and needs to continue to grow. Um, and that's why a really updated book, I, I don't call it a new edition because so much has changed that I think of it as a, a new version of the old book, but essentially a new book, and that's why it's now called Animal Liberation Now. Um, and I think you know, that's necessary, and I hope that that will provide an extra boost for the movement and will bring new people into the movement um, so that we can achieve the victories, build on what we have achieved, and, and go further in reducing the suffering of animals. We're out of time, and I'm afraid that there are, my team is just kind of go, go, go. Uh, so they might send security up to pull us down. But I can't leave the stage without the most important question. That is, does Peter Singer think we will achieve animal liberation? Yes, Peter Singer does think we will achieve animal <laughs> liberation. Yay! But... <laughs> oh, you haven't heard the back. But, there was a but. There was a but. There, there was, was a but. but. The but is, I don't know when. <laughs> um, but I do think, I, another book that I wrote a while ago, it's a, it's a somewhat more academic book, is called The Expanding Circle. And in it, I trace the development of morality from a tribal morality for small groups of people, expanding outwards to include larger groups, nations, um, at one point maybe the European morality included all Europeans, but did not include Africans. Eventually, we expanded so that in the 20th century, we had the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was a proclamation of all human beings having rights. So that circle has expanded a long way over a long period of time, but it has not expanded enough because it's not only human beings who we need to consider. But I do think that in the end, that outward growth will be irresistible and it will extend to all sentient beings and that will be the achievement of animal liberation. Um, but it's, you know, it's a long struggle. It's been a long struggle to overcome racism and sexism and those struggles are not really completed yet, though they've made enormous progress. Um, so uh, it's going to be a long struggle. For this but we period. will achieve. We will. We will achieve. The man, the activist, the philosopher, the legend, please joining me, join me in giving him a round of applause.
Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks,